Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 255. That's 255 of the Agostino Zynga show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. Good to know. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, a five-star review. I've seen a ton on there recently. I've got about 10 already so far. So thank you for those of you who have left a five-star review on your podcast app, especially what the Apple podcast app anyway. And if you haven't left your review, what are you waiting for? Please leave me a five-star review on Apple podcast. That'll be much more you know i'd be so internally grateful if you could do that and spare you know take out five minutes a day to do so that obviously help the rankings help to get the show out there and all that good stuff and of course support via patreon is always more than welcome too you can support the show at patreon.com forward slash a g o s t i n h o that's patreon dot com for slash a g o s t i n h o get involved on there you get a bonus episode every week available for my patreon subscribers only as well as some other perks and bonuses you go and subscribe at patreon.com for slash a g o s t a n h o for as little as one dollar per month you get access to all those bonus shows don't delay get involved over there today i uh, hope you guys are well wherever you may be man how's it going episode number 255 or 255 455 actually i think it's 455 it should be 455 either way hope you're good wherever you are it is what monday morning of bank holiday i'm here vibing um getting ready before i head to the gym of course so day are from work so that's pretty good getting some quick podcasting before the day unravels as i mentioned previously this has probably been one of my better periods during the lockdown you know being able to do the things i actually love to do been able to enforce some level of structure to my day-to-day and now i just need to get my money up that's basically it get the money up start becoming creative again um obviously you know, i've mentioned previously i'm going to do a few live stream dj sets as well so gonna get that itch kind of scratched do a few more maybe other live streams i've got some other stuff i'm propping and thinking about doing maybe you're gonna dip, dabble my feet back in the promoting pool again if the whole you know me playing in bars and pubs probably doesn't materialize until maybe late at the end of the year that's the thing i'm curious about because i don't know what to do i'm not too sure if i should be reaching out to some of my old um contacts at bars and pubs ahead of the reopening and saying hey have you got any spots that can come at play at or if i should be waiting for the call because i assume a lot of people are probably harassing these people um or if i should just be active and just be looking like i do previously because you know most of my stuff that i got beforehand was never inbound most of it was always outbound i'm always reaching out to things and i think prior to the lockdown that my plan was to go and do a little set for that H-O-R-E radio station in Berlin. So that was a, a, the, the initial thing. I had some initial contacts with them. But then, you know, after the first bit of contact, it kind of died down over a period. So maybe that's because, you know, they probably just didn't think I was that good enough. Or most likely because they have hundreds and hundreds of people already in their home city that they have to kind of accommodate for. And people that are assigned to agencies and shit. So it's probably a little bit more difficult than I maybe envisage to get on those kind of places. But that was the hope, right? To kind of go on there because, you know, to do the stuff here in London, there's, there's a few stations it's like you know nts obviously i don't even listen to it so that would be a bit incongruent and i'm just not in you know i'm not i just can't do this is the this is one of my issues i've had even when i was you know trying to be involved within the streetwear sneaker scene and stuff and whatever and i kind of you know stepped back from that and kind of did my own thing for a while i find it very difficult to ask for things especially in that capacity and to kind of be around and sort of like you know do the whole game that people do because there is a game to it all right in order to kind of get in the good graces of people that run these online radio stations it's kind of beneficial if you're like in with other people who are also you know cool with them because i can also help you to kind of jump the queue because i know it did when i was first promoting one of the reasons why we had the chance to do the party in alibi was because we were friends or we were we were cordial with one of the guys that was leading the nike energy marketing front who was responsible for the uk store and he was kind of very close with the guy that managed the alibi so that was a reason why we kind of got in there and it kind of jump you know push us up on the you know uh, list of priorities or whatever it may be but i think if we were just regular guys from the street it probably would have been a lot harder for us to get that position and to get that slot and again it's you know it's a bit um irrelevant now because things have moved on but at that time that slot was really important do you know what i mean really 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 important 
and it kind of did you know allow me to kind of do the things I ended up doing you know prior so I do kind of credit it as to being a very important part of my overall journey but again that was kind of something that's kind of thrust on me kind of given us me and my co-founder at the time an opportunity to do so it wasn't something I kind of sourced or was able to kind of get in touch with it didn't work out that way so there is a skill and there is a need to do that kind of thing but I just kind of do it man I just I don't know if it's ego or if it's pride or if it's a combination of the two or it's just my delusions of grandeur where I think I'm way better than what I am um, that's not allowing me to do those sort of things or because I have you know my in my mind I'm looking at myself like my heroes or I'm kind of wanting to aim for instead of all these middling people I don't know what it is but I just can't do it and I know for sure I'm definitely 100% sure that sort of mindset is definitely holding me back because it's kind of I, I, I definitely am aware that having that mindset is probably could be interpreted as being a little bit arrogant not a little bit probably a lot it could be a little bit you know uh, a little bit snobby um, and it maybe is a little bit of entitlement involved in there too there could be a little bit of sense of entitlement as in I deserve I, I don't really go around like that to be fair I do kind of go from I do kind of get my own opportunities like there were times where I would be going out and handing out flipping flyers to places and saying hey I'm DJ as well if you want me to play in the place I didn't really care I was always about getting in behind the desk be getting behind the desk regardless of where it was just so I can get some time in the field because I've always been under the idea under the illusion that if I just play enough I'll end up getting better because I always knew I had good taste I always knew I was you know the music that I'm into a lot of people would probably dance to I just need to obviously gain that experience of being able to play in front of a live audience because it's just there really is nothing like playing in front of a live audience playing in playing in a club playing in a festival whatever it may be getting that experience is really important to kind of differentiate between you know you being okay and you being amazing and that probably is maybe the big separating uh, factor when it comes to you know some of your DJing people that you look up to or people that you think are sick it's not really the fact that they have access to tunes that you could never get a hold of because most things even with the even if you rip them on YouTube you can get most songs if you want them really um, it's more so their ability to know how to play what to play when right that kind of idea of like reading the crowd of you know um, how to build up anticipation and you know how to kind of be able to enforce a law in order to clear the dance floor and kind of reset the whole thing like all these little tricks that you only learn when you actually play in front of a live crowd is something that I've kind of always really um, held dear and been like hey I don't care where I play even if it's in a pub if it's in a park if it's for you know in the corner of an art gallery and no one wants you to be there I'm gonna make sure that I get some live in action minutes under my belt so that when I finally do step out and have a chance to play these big things people are gonna be like oh shit this guy's really good it's like yeah because i've been playing for you know six years in pubs for every month or every weekend yeah i mean monday to friday to saturday friday to saturday, friday to saturday that's definitely going to add to your level now the only problem with that sort of thing is that sometimes if you do play in those sort of establishments you tend to not play the most um you tend to not probably play the most forward-thinking music in the world right maybe sometimes you might appease um the crowd a little bit too often but over time I've kind of gained confidence in myself and known that I can sort of like take the crowd on a journey and I can sort of like you know give them things to sort of hold them down and then whilst also playing stuff for me that I am also into that I also want to kind of play out there so that's been a bit of a balance um but yeah I'm interested I don't know what to do maybe I should reach out to these guys prior to June 31st or June 21st sorry and just say hey I'm still about I haven't died fortunately touch wood um I, I didn't move away um you know i didn't retire i'm still around if you want me in you know uh put me in coach or just do what everyone else does and just make my own party and book myself <laughs> do you know what i mean and then do that what that what's that guy did the guy at circus he booked he, he organized a party that you know that first dance the, the obviously the trial thing in liverpool and then he inserted himself before what was it Bef uh, after bless madonna and then before um and then before Sven Bar, right? That's the way you want to do it. If you really want to kind of put yourself in position, you just insert yourself in between two of the biggest sort of like, you know, artists out at the moment in terms of, you know, following and all that malarkey. It's absolutely insane. But yeah, I don't know. Let's see what to do. Let's see what I'm going to do. But anyway, um, jam pack show for you today as per usual so make sure you grab yourself a little drink inside into munch on if they are that way inclined and we're just going to get started in it we're going to get involved um first things first what we're going to talk about oh yeah let's talk about this because it's the first thing on my mind so this is courtesy of sky sports 
Manchester United v Liverpool postponed after anti Glazer fan protests at Old Trafford. So United were meant to play Liverpool yesterday, uh, one of the biggest games of the season for Eva fans and for maybe football fans in this country. All in, whenever the fixture list comes out, that's one of the first things um, Man United fans or Liverpool fans sort of look for. Obviously, your local derby in terms of you know respectively Man City and Everton, but also kind of playing your neighbours is also something that you kind of want to do. And consider during the failed um, attempt for uh, both owners of Manchester United and Liverpool to join the European Super League, which would have effectively crumbled and destroyed whatever football period of it that we have now in, the, in this country that we hold dear and essentially, you know, created a walled garden of no consequences for these big major clubs to just continue making ha money hand over fist without really a need to improve the squad and all that sort of stuff going forward because that's basically a bit of a misnomer too. I, I have seen... I'm not seeing a lot of people, but I have seen some people who've defended the European Super League, more so in the sense of like saying, hey, this thing is inevitable. It's going to happen some way or the other, which is a fair. I understand that. I think we have a version of the Europe European Super League at the moment now with the Champions League, considering how certain countries get a certain allo allo allotment of um, teams in the Champions League, even though the, you know that country hasn't won a Champions League in, in a while. So th those things are obviously in play. And some leagues have their version of a European Super League. Look at the Liga and the discrepancy in money, TV money that the top two clubs, Real Madrid and Barcelona, get compared to everybody else. I think I heard someone say it's something akin to like, you know, Barcelona and Real Madrid get 250 million euros and then the rest of the Euro Liga get like 20 million euros. So there's definitely a little bit of favoritism um, that's placed um, in some of these leagues and kind of, you know, benefit given to some of the bigger teams because they, you know, technically bring in the biggest viewers. But then overall, if you want to actually create a better balanced league and you want to recognize the contribution of all the other teams, you probably should make it a bit more fair. But regardless, people are saying, you know, those things are going forward. But one of the misnomers, I think, about European Super League is this idea that because these teams are going to be getting, what, 400 million euros or 400 million or whatever it is, between 200 million to 400 million just to participate in the league year in, year out, which is not including whatever they're going to make from, you know, um, streaming their own games via their apps and websites the understanding is from some fans is that oh that money is going to go back into investing into the club and making us great again but uh, that's the issue the issue here is that with the system we have now at the moment teams are rewarded for finishing further up the table you know from fourth upwards teams are also rewarded for winning cups and trophies and so are you know the players that play for these teams and the managers it's sort of kind of incentive based to, you know to kind of add your name to the overall legacy of a club to create big moments for the fans but once you create the european super league there is no real um push and need for these clubs to reinvest that money into making the teams and squads better especially if you know there's already a few teams in the league already have a head start what's why would you go out of your way to kind of cripple yourself financially to get to a place where you can challenge for the league when it doesn't really matter that much because you can't get relegated so anyway um back to this protest so a lot of main night fans were really pissed off at that obviously considering what the glazers have done to the club you know taking out loans against the club putting us into debt you know taking out dividends and not really in you know investing in the team and the structure of the club of rural old trafford is dilapidated our training center is pretty crap and considering the amount of money we spent on transfers we don't necessarily have the most glitzy galactico you know laden team that you would ever imagine right because we spend a lot of money in transfers but we don't really spend it wisely you know we're a mismanaged club you know directionless we've only just recently hired a director of football after how many years in the doldrums and even that person seems like a little bit of a um, you know a little bit of a of a hire just to appease the fans for the time being not necessarily somebody that's the best in class as some people would say funnily enough Gary Neville hasn't really commented on the fact that this guy is just the dude that was already at the club for six or so years um, didn't really pull up any trees and now suddenly he's been given the helm of being director of football with Darren Fletcher assisting him who just the other day was you know running around cones and kicking balls back to players but we digress so um, I guess a section of the United fans decided to take this protest a step further and decided to do it during the Liverpool um, game and decided to kind of, you know, infiltrate the ground, go on the pitch, jump all over the nets, go in the changing room and just 
basically cause a ruckus to the point where the game had to be postponed and I'm here for it. I love it. I love to see it. I love the fans taking back some level of control from the owners and basically reminding them that they're custodians. Even though I was a bit negative and I was a bit bleak before, and I was thinking to myself, you know what, all these protests aren't going to do anything. These owners aren't going to leave. They're just going to bleed this club dry because they have to. Because why else wouldn't they? Um, they've, made, they've effectively purchased something so they can't be forced to sell it regardless of how bad of owners they are. I just feel like, you know, they've weathered, you know, levies and levies of kind of bad PR really, really easily without even batting an eyelid. So I don't see how this is suddenly going to make any difference. But I think the momentum of this and the fact that people are now waking up to how crappy of an owner um, the Glazers have been and the mismanagement of such a big and historic club like United, especially when you're going forward and seeing what other teams are doing in terms of putting their ducks in a row, we've definitely kind of seen that unless we get owners in who actually have an idea and a clue of what they're doing, we could be rudderless and kind of like without you know getting back onto our perch in any kind of meaningful way for a long long period of time especially when you realize just what all these other teams are doing in the league and also in europe so let's read through a bit of the article here it says um Manchester United Premier League game against Liverpool Old Trafford was postponed following protests against the Glazer family hundreds of the fans got into the stadium ahead of the behind the closed doors contest which was originally scheduled for a very kickoff before being delayed then called off completely discussions are taking place around um finding a new date for the fixture um, two police officers were injured during the police um, silent demonstrations with one hospitalized after sustaining a significant slash wound to his face according to Graham Manchester Police and again these are one of the things isn't it? this is sometimes protest if you want to send the message this is the only way you're going to send the message by actually causing a bit of ruckus you know maybe drawing some blood here and there and keeping it moving it's an unfortunate consequence of a protest I think this idea that protests are going to be you know polite and well mannered and you know just exactly abide by the rules don't necessarily um kind of heed to the history of protests and also they don't necessarily make the change effectively as you probably hope they would or kind of you know push it or kind of help to sway the momentum in any sort of meaningful way but this actually does and if you've seen some of the footage of the police engaging with some of the protesters you won't be too upset about someone slash getting their face slashed because i saw a video of a protest of a police officer punching a protester that's on the floor um clearly detained by two or three other police officers and punching the head or the back or something it was really disgusting to watch actually it continues it said united statement read following the discussion between the police the premier league the traffic center council and the clubs our club match against liverpool has been postponed due to safety and security considerations around the protest today discussions will now take place with the premier league on the revised day of the fixture our fans are the passionate about man united and we completely acknowledge the right for free expression of peaceful protest however we regret the disruption of the team and the actions we put our fans and our staff and police in danger we thank the police for their support and we will assist them in their subsequent investigations and obviously you've got a video here of some of the protests let me play a bit of that hopefully I don't get taken Manchester down United, Manchester United have a rich history of ups and downs and uh, this was unprecedented even in the context of that what we saw here on the forecourt at Old Trafford was sinister and it bit. would sinister go fuck yourself the covid breaches that they represented as well that's why okay uh, let's let's skip that sinister liverpool said that they were in full agreement with the decision to postpone and will continue to dialogue with Man united it's a position of public safety must be a number one factor in the such decision with the ability to provide a secure environment for the participants staff and officials being a particular priority said a club statement so yeah man like again i'm i'm, I'm here for it um the interesting thing is seeing some of the uh backlash from it you see some people basically saying, which I kind of agree with, but I'm not, I, I think it's fair, but also maybe not so fair. The whole like, oh, how can you be Glazers out by Oli in? It's kind of a big, a big kind of um, dividing line between United fans because unfortunately, for some reason, we are one of the most divided fan bases out there. And most of it has to do with players and managers. I don't know what is going on at the moment, but it seems to be some odd factions within the United kind of fan base, especially when you consider how big of a club we are and how successful we've been over the years. You, you would think that our fan base would just care about trophies and playing good football. They wouldn't necessarily care about who is the person coaching us at that moment in time. But it seems like there's a little bit, you know, there's some residue of there's, there's some Mourinho fanboys, some Louis van Gaal fanboys even, right? There's some weird groups of factions of fans out there but some people basically say that how because Oli's gone out of his way which is a, a, a kind of precise statement to make Oli has gone out of his way to defend the Glazers and to sort of like you know 
throughout the up kind of you know be a supporting uh, voice for them out there in the public people are basically saying that you can't be all glazers out if you're ollie in because ollie is basically a puppet of the glazers which i would ex accept for some extent i think for all our former managers ollie's probably been the most pro glazer i've ever seen maybe with the exception of david Moyes, who was obviously giddy that he got the job from everton in the first place but ollie's definitely gone out of his way to really make it known that he kind of supports what the glazer is doing with the club and he has actually no problem with them which is kind of ironic when you consider how vocal he was about their ownership beforehand and um, when he wasn't obviously the manager of united but as soon as he stepped into that big chair and he basically was given a job that he probably on paper shouldn't have never gotten um when you kind of look at his credentials and whatnot but obviously because of the good vibes of, you know, he basically was able to imbue in the club after the, the disastrous reign of Mourinho and during that interim period, it made sense he was given a role, don't get me wrong. But I think as a big club looking at it, you should have probably been a little bit more, you know, uh, cautious as to who you give the full-time role to going forward. But now we know with the European Super League that United's intention was to always join a league that would basically allow them to be unambitious and allow them to not really be in it for footballing reasons. It was always going to be a commercial thing so actually the odd thing is the fact that we're not in a european super league and people are pushing for new ownership this might actually put ollie's job in more danger than it was before because ollie's definitely going to be somebody that the glazer would love especially if he's able to prove um demonstrably now going forward that he's able to secure us top four football season in season out he's going to be the perfect kind he's be basically our version of arsene wenger right basically be able to turn top four into a trophy maybe pick up the old domestic trophy here and there and just keep trucking along and that will mean sure we get the champions league money good tv rights money um good exposure in europe of course, of course continue that legacy um which you know they've players have no part in building blah 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 so it's a very interesting state of affairs that we're in at the moment do i agree can you be glazers in and ollie Glazers out and Oli in? Not really. I still think you can separate the two. I still think you should cut Oli some slack because obviously he's working for these people. He can't go out of his way and completely slate them. But I do understand the fact that he has been a little bit too forgiving. You know, I think the other day, supposedly it was alleged he said something like, oh, Joe Glazer loves the club or something stupid like that. And in response, someone told him, no, he loves the dividends. So there is obviously a concern about that. But I think overall, he is only doing his best right considering the position that he's put in is a bit awkward um i think it's helped obviously we're in a good league position people are not really pressing him that much but it is a bit odd that he kind of goes out of his way to defend the glazers so much it's not very really necessary but again game postponed will probably kick off another time but it's a good message sent to the glazers overall that we are not playing around that we're not playing around let's move on here let's make sure i didn't use up too much of my time let's go for the next one. Oh, the next one this this is going to be annoying this is going to frustrate me so the finale season was it seven i think it was season seven of um flipping line of duty was the other day right it just finished so um what an absolute horror show what was that what kind of bullshit was that can someone explain to me what that was what was that right that finale was maybe one of the worst things i've seen in probably since game of thrones and at least with game of thrones you could argue that the writers had an excuse because you know george R. R., um, whatever his name is george R. R. martin yeah was his name right um hadn't finished the books right he still hasn't finished the books he's still writing blogs basically explaining why he hasn't finished the books and excusing himself why he's science flipping multi-million dollar multi-year tv contracts right absolute piss take that guy liability in the you know in the most extreme but they could basically argue that hey the books weren't done and we were trying to fill the gaps right and it was hard to do so to continue that momentum and you know some of the bits especially when you watch you know game of thrones from maybe season one to four like some of the threads that were left open that were never closed were just annoying but they were also one of some of the most kind of in-depth layered sort of like interesting tv you've watched in probably a long long time especially when it comes to fantasy sci-fi whatever that category is there's just in a league of its own but then of course it went off a cliff after that and the ending was you know nothing short of disappointing so disappointing that i'm probably sure a lot of people haven't maybe even revisited watching game of thrones again i i've watched what 
I went back to watch True Detective Season 1, which was amazing. I've watched The Wire again. I've watched Sopranos. I've watched bits and pieces of Breaking Bad. The real hallmark of a series that's great is going back to the previous seasons and just kind of refreshing yourself and reminding yourself of just how awesome of a time this was. But I'm going to say on the limb here, this Line of Duty finale was so bad, it might have tarnished even the good seasons of Line of Duty, which were, I would say, Season 1, 2 and 3. It might have tarnished those two. That was horrendous. After all these years, right, of trying to figure out who H is, um, we have now kind of come to the, again, if you're watching this, please skip ahead. If you don't want any spoilers, please skip ahead. Please skip ahead. But supposedly, H is who? Ian Buckles. After all this time, H is Ian Buckles, one of the numbnuts of the entire series, somebody who the writers have clearly tried to paint out as somebody who's kind of failed upwards despite his overall, um, you know, shitty, his, his overall crappy um, performance levels. He's been able to succeed despite of how crappy he is at his job, maybe a marker of like white privilege or just, you know, um, institutional nepotism, whatever it is. He's been written well, very well as a character, but we were under no assumptions that Ian Buckles was this mastermind. It was always the assumption I uh, was always given the impression that he was a dum-dum and now you're telling me he was the guy that was pulling the strings from a prison cell on a laptop that he had hidden that he was able to kind of reroute the IP to address in Spain are you flipping out of your mind it wasn't they didn't even try to make it believable that he was using a tablet or an iPhone or something he had a whole laptop in his flipping cell in prison that he was able to kind of communicate with other men other members of the flipping ocg are you having a, are you having a laugh did we find out what happened to gave galvella the journalist that was, that's kind of at the center of this entire season who got murked in front of her own home did we find out exactly why she got murked funny thing is that in these series that the journalists actually do put themselves you know um in the line of fire you know with actual investigative journalism that doesn't center around somebody saying a naughty word on the podcast that's actually pretty interesting right the journalists on tv shows are actually far more competent at their jobs and actually do what you'd expect a journalist to do than people in real life that aside we didn't get really any knowledge about that that kid what's his name the little kid that grew up to be a police officer that ended up murking a few people that just happened they just died finished we didn't really find out anything there the whole storyline of steve damaging his back and then using and then trying to od on ibuprofen what was the point of that really nothing he didn't lose his job he didn't it, like what happened really that kind of you know we care about that sort of shit like absolute horror show of a show absolute horror show of an ending now the only excuse i could have for this is that the writers when they were writing the final season quote unquote weren't aware if they were going to get another season they weren't sure if they were going to get renewed don't ask me why i'm assuming line of jews probably one of the highest viewed series on the bbc hands down but the bbc are really odd with the shows that they let run the shows that they cancel it's just a complete shit show over there so maybe they weren't aware of when they were actually if they were going to be renewed so they purposely writ the end of this season to be as open-ended as possible so that if they do revisit it, they can pick up all these threads and just carry on as per normal. But I have to be honest, as a long-time fan, I'm kind of annoyed and put off from completely even following this thing overall. I can't do it. Like, I wasted years of my life to kind of get to this point and then they tell me that, who's H that was what who H was. They had this whole timeline um they kind of imbued this whole thing about um uh christopher lawrence and named him lawrence christopher right talking about you know um, institutional racism and police brutality and all this sort of stuff some interesting points that could be spoken about corruption of course right but what did we really get to the heart of at the end of it did we get to the heart of it is that the criminals get away or eventually that most people get corrupted that broken police officers who you know have delusions of maybe restoring faith in the police institution are basically doomed um what did we get here we didn't get anything and what who's this lady that took over what's her name that everyone seems to love on social media what was the point in her kind of subtly taking over but then standing in the background whilst they interview one of the main corporates anyway what was the point of this guy being accused of being h in the first place like there's so many things so many questions i have that really don't really add up in this whole episode this whole season this whole f f show was a complete fail at the end of it 
and again that's what i'm saying they've legitimately ruined the way that i've viewed now the previous seasons especially season one two or three they've completely ruined it there were, there were moments between this dude and this dude right where they spoke about you know corruption and how deep it goes and you don't know what's going on and we still don't know what's going on they still haven't given us any answers this is a complete shocker and a waste of time and honestly it's just um it makes me appreciate a lot more now oh, let's get this off the screen it, it really makes me appreciate really really good um tv series that end on the high note it really doesn't make me appreciate them now because sometimes we take good writing for granted because i remember there was a period in time in hollywood where a lot of these tv series were basically you know not the best and kind of going on a bit of a on a dead run but that was because of a writer's strike right if i remember correctly um but these sort of things have no excuse they have so many so much source material there's such a great legacy with great cop dramas here in the uk you think of stuff like the bill right that had some really great moments in it um you know there was a which is a crappy example but there was strike force which was decent for a period in time there's some really good stuff that was you know filmed here um there was what was that thing called there was the last panthers i watched for a bit that was i think filmed by sky or itv that was really good it kind of a tv series centered around you know the pink panthers um diamond heart diamond heisting you know uh bank robbing uh crime syndicate uh, based out of i'm gonna say central europe somewhere in serbia or one of those kind of countries um really really great series right so we've got a lot of really great writers here who obviously have a a thing for writing great thrillers and espionage type stuff and in the end like what was all that for what a waste of time like it's really frustrating me but again maybe the silver lining is you get to really appreciate that's his or is it ram pilkinson whatever his name is right the, um, you really get to appreciate good writing when it's there you get to appreciate really good moments you really get to appreciate really good series and seasons that end on an absolute high note like you think of the wire right four seasons of absolute wall-to-wall -wall bangers and it just ends really well and then you think of other shows that have just continued on and kind of bled themselves dry i don't know man i don't know it was very disappointing disappointing really pretty much ruined my sunday and effectively made me get completely turned off from the line of duty franchise or in its entirety and i really don't care if they come back I've, I, they've kind of lost me as a fan I'm, I'm dead i'm dead i'm gone and then you've got this story here from lad bible it says um line of duty creative response to finale backlash with a cryptic tweet right he did that kind of pussy thing that people do where if they tweet something and they don't want to get any backlash they turn off the comments annoying right so it says here um jed marusio appears to have responded to following the backlash he received after the disappointing line of duty season six of the bbc uh, cop drama aired yesterday evening with fans split on how they felt about the ending namely the identity of h or the fourth man which is allegedly flipping ian buckles in the end it turned out that it was ian buckles <sighs> so shit the bumbling incompetent fool was the man behind it all some fans however wanted uh, more than that from the finale and weren't backwards and and weren't backward in their and weren't backward oh what's that in coming forward about it in a tweet following the ending marusio posted a photo of the ac12 insignia with the caption carry the fire one of the superintendent ted hastings lines from the series carry the fire what does that mean like ugh, fuck you having removed comments from the post it is thought that marisha's tweet is in response to the criticism level of the show for how the plot unfolded let's see what let's see if someone was quote tweeted it because that's that could be a really good insight into some what some people are saying out there in the kind of social media space has it been quote tweeted has it been it's been read oh you have to read to it. okay no you can't actually view it unfortunately but yeah ugh, what a waste of time man honestly what a complete waste of time um line of duty um season six but maybe i'm in the wrong here let me know in the comments below if you actually enjoyed it i'll be interested to hear your opinion on that one what else do we have here moving on oh we have this this is absolutely um terrible news i guess if you're a fan of you know kiddohood adulthood and that whole thing um no clark has been accused of being a little bit of a predator a little bit of a creep not a little bit uh, a pretty excessive one right 20 plus people women actually specifically have come out and kind of cataloged a whole bevy of ins of insurrections um that he's kind of been insurrections 
um, you know what I mean, uh, things that he's been basically doing behind the scenes that have maybe called into question, you know, his entire legacy and what he's done for movies in the UK in general. And again, as a fan of the movies that he's put out in the past, it's obviously clearly disappointing. But as I've pointed out in a lot of these um, instances where people, high-ranking individuals within the entertainment industry are being accused of being predators, I've always pointed out the fact that I think monsters, by and large, will always exist in society. I don't think we'll ever rid ourselves of people who take advantage of others in especially places or sectors like the entertainment industry, which by and large is kind of built on exploitation. There's always going to be somebody who's going to take it that bit further and kind of, you know, um, use their power, influence, uh, whatever it is, position that they have to gain whatever advantage or you know to kind of scratch whatever desire that they want to have scratched and unfortunately the people on the lower rungs of that kind of level of influence and power are the ones that are going to be impacted the worst with that sort of thing it won't really affect the higher ups because you know someone like that isn't going to um spoil um or ruin their friendships or their burn their bridges by trying to abuse somebody that's actually in a position of power similar to theirs they're always going to take advantage of somebody that they deem to be lower which is obviously the lowest thing that you could ever do to somebody with that being said it is a responsibility of the industry itself to call out these people and hold them to account which is why i would say having read this whole entire article and a few of the other ones going forward i'm under no illusion in my opinion personally i just don't think he did this sort of stuff without anybody knowing within the industry i don't believe it i think people knew people kind of chose to turn a blind eye because at that moment in time he was you know hard than flipping fish grease he was one of the main people responsible for putting out certain type of movies and being behind a certain type of tv series that represented a certain type of people in the uk and people wanted to align themselves with him because he had all the momentum and they didn't want to call it out because it served their purpose it wasn't you know um it wasn't advantageous to their career prospects to be the one kind of calling him out for his disgusting behavior so he was able to go on uncontested um and inflict more and more pain to allegedly to more and more people over the years and now we're in a position where it finally come to a head but again i wouldn't give any of these people pats on the back especially the ones in the higher up positions for essentially coming forward and saying these things because the ones that have been really affected as you read the entire thing are people who are kind of on the periphery of the industry but also very important and vital to the scene i did a couple of extra gigs right and i remember being in the changing rooms and doing hair and makeup and stuff and talking to the people behind the scenes and usually they're very upfront about who's a dick and who isn't a dick and it's a very kind of um small world they all know each other right they all kind of are familiar with who was on what who did what and who did who did this who did that and word kind of travels very very quickly so i'm I I refuse to believe that this is some sort of new revelation. I'm sure people within the acting, drama, um, theatre world had some inkling about No Clark's alleged behaviour, but they were unwilling to say something because at that time it served their purpose to kind of keep him sweet and to kind of, you know, extract whatever value they could out of it for their own situation. So this is the article here from The Guardian. It says, um, obviously, as predator actor Noel Clark accused of groping, harassment and bullying by 20 women. It says when Noel Clark appeared on stage at the Royal Albert Hall on 10th of April to collect his BAFTA, a typically self-assured actor looked a little on edge. Viewers might have concluded that Clark was simply overwhelmed. He was clutching one of the precious accolades bestowed, bestowed on him by the British Academy of Film, Television and Art the prize for outstanding British contributions to cinema yet there were other reasons why Clark and BAFTA may have felt procured preoccupied sorry um 13 days before the presenting clark with his award the guardian investigation can conveal bafta was informed about the existence of several allegations of verbal abuse bullying and s harassment against clark bafta does not dispute it's received those anonymous emails reports and allegations via intermediaries but said that it was provided with no evidence that it would allow it to investigate so again they were sitting on their hands they were kind of put you know the evidence was put forward to them but instead of investigating it they wanted to be held you know by the hand similar to ds p when he's playing his games online and they went to be held you know um handholded throughout the entire process in order to kind of get some sort of justice for the victims and obviously you can see no clark's face there a face of somebody that, that probably is of the knowledge that you know things are going to go tumbling down from this moment on I'm, I'm and i'm curious i would love 
to be a fly on the wall to some of these instances where people get cancelled in this way um what that must do to your psyche what that must do to your family to your immediate circle of friends and what actually happens do your phone calls suddenly stop getting answered does your wife take the kids away and go to a hotel um are you punching the wall are you streaming into a pillow like when you know that this is going to be happening or when it actually does happen and the articles are out there it must be some it must be one of the worst positions to be in and i guess if you're a victim of some of these crimes that must bring some level of satisfaction because i don't know what could be done with some of the allegations in terms of criminal um offenses but i guess one of the only sort of bits of um, solace you can glean from this if you're a victim allegedly of the crimes that he allegedly done is that he's really suffering right now he's going through it the turmoil that he's suffering from is is probably unparalleled when it comes to where he was and where he's going to be for the future going forward because as per usual even if he's found innocent the fact that he's accused of these things is bad enough for his entire reputation to be in complete tatters so this is a wild wild situation right to go from that to suddenly have this article put out about you god almighty how the mighty fall in it clark also became aware of the allegations which he vehemently denies as he stepped on stage holding his gone clark reputation remained publicly unbe unblemished not as a, just an actor a producer screenwriter and director but also one who could claim to be one of british film and television's most lauded stars the about decision to venerate to venerate sorry clark moved um, numerous women to break their silence they alleged clark is a serial abuser of women using his power in the industry to prey on and harass female colleagues and sometimes bully those who fall out of favor which is why sometimes it's hard and which is why even though i'm not a fan of this trial by social media crap that's going on at the moment i do think if he's accused of these crimes he should be held to account and go to a court of law and you know they should be able to decide what his punishment should be but you can't just be putting out articles about people and have their entire lives be taken away from them but the other thing why i kind of do sometimes think they do kind of serve a greater good is that sometimes even if a story gets put out that maybe isn't the most factually correct maybe there's some instances that aren't the most you know watertight and maybe a few accounts are a bit shaky and people just clout chasing or just wanting the attention because i'm sure that happens if you're there's 10 accusers who come forward you know it's no um it's no uh it's not victim blaming by saying that potentially there could be two or three in there who are just completely talking out of their ass what actually does happen though with the story being put out is that girls who are not kind of confident and weren't really brave enough to step forward at first might gain that confidence when they see those stories and be like oh i recognize parts and pieces of these accounts from things that happened to me and then they're willing to step forward so if you're the one being accused of these things the worst thing by and large is obviously to be accused you don't want to ever want to be somebody that's you know being thought of as a creep or a predator because more likely than not if you have other demons in your closet they're also going to come out it's just inevitable someone else is going to say hey this and this happened to me and then suddenly it's gone from being you know 20 people to 55 you know what i mean and then you're looking absolutely wild out here um so it continues here we can read some of the allegations okay so this is the this is one the, the first one and maybe one that kind of gives you an idea of like why this is probably something that i've always been really disgusted with when it comes to people that do this sort of stuff because it obviously involves people who are not in a position to kind of i want to say argue but not in a position to kind of stand up for themselves, especially in the entertainment industry, because it's predatory, right? The entertainment industry is exploitive. They do kind of, you know, actors and whatever performers are having to sing and dance for their, basically, for their supper. They're having to, you know, for lack of a better term, kiss people's asses in order to get a job, in order to be considered for a job, in order to get into certain rooms. So because of that, it just gives... Um, it gives the breathing room and it gives the kind of field for absolute creepos to come in there and take advantage and it's always the ones that get affected are the ones that are always you know on the come up or people that are just on the outskirts for instance on this report there's producers here there's assistant directors there's so many different people who are kind of integral to kind of keeping that entire ecosystem of the you know entertainment industry running tv film movies and stuff um who are also kind of depend on this stuff as an actual job and working as an actual career who have probably suffered other bits of harassment and abuse throughout their throughout their time in it it's just so so frustrating that you'd want to do this to these kind of people because they're the again they're the ones that glue this scene together that clue the industry together don't get me wrong and i've only known this for a brief period of time being an extra of how important these people are and how important it is that you treat them with respect but you know 
some people just take the piss out of their position. So he continues. He says, the one says Clark, this is one of the one of the accounts. Prolific and influential filmmaker. So Clark is one of the most prolific um, actors and filmmakers in the UK. Skip that. Um, Clark writes and executive uh, produces and stars alongside Ashley Waters in Bulletproof, one of Sky's biggest shows. Series 4 is in pre-production. His other company, Unstoppable Film Temp and Tim Films Television. I'm speaking so shit right now. Please forgive me for reading out loud really crappily. It continues uh, really crappily, really badly. Um, he's produced more than 10 films in, in addition to Bulletproof and a Channel 5 drama, The Drowning. He is on the BAFTA Influential Film Committee and is a mentor for ITV, bringing him into contact with young, aspiring screenwriters. Only this week, Clark has been starring ITV's new flagship prime drama, Viewpoint, airing each evening, Monday to Friday. Um, Gianni, Gianna Powell worked with Carl as a producer between September 2014 and March 2017 during Brotherhood. She told The Guardian that Clark would constantly harass her on one occasion, telling her that when he hired her, he had planned to F her and fire her. So I guess this is this type of humor and banter and jokes, which is weird when you consider that supposedly um, their relationship was based on mentorship. He kind of helped her get into some drama school or something. And then from there kind of basically guided her throughout her career. So, and so, so basically acted like a big brother. And then suddenly the bro brother is basically telling you that he wants to, you know, get up to any sorts of business with you in there. So that's when, you know, somebody is already a bit of a wrong and from that alone, she um she dis she also alleges that Clark would brag about storing sexually explicit pictures and videos on his hard drive, including footage he told that he'd secretly filmed during naked of naked auditions. Do you know how maddening that must be? Like if you're an actor, that you have somebody out there potentially keeping up footage of you that's been filmed without your permission, especially when you're naked. God almighty. Powell says that Clark once showed her a secretly recorded video on one such audition with Jana James, an actor in Brotherhood. Powell said that four people, um, that four people about Clark's, um, Powell told four people about Clark's alleged film, secret filming, all of whom confirmed the conversations with The Guardian. They include James, her friend, whom she told about the incident in the winter of 2017 in the pub of South London. So it's obviously corroborating the account that it actually happened, that conversation. The naked audition had taken place more than four years previously from the film Legacy. Powell also was able to describe an exact haircut James had had at the time. Her hair is usually long and blonde, but after a hairdresser disaster, um, she had cropped it short and returned to her natural brown. So if ever there was any sort of, you know, um, confusion or doubt as to whether or not he has this alleged footage on his phone or somewhere within his possession, which is I'd allege, which I would allege if he did have it, it's probably been destroyed by now. Um, this was it. The person was able to kind of say exactly what that girl's haircut was like because of something that she hasn't necessarily worn. Maybe something that's never been on social media. Like, that must be chilling. James recalls Clark had talked her into auditioning for the role. She had been she had been hesitant. She was only twenty three and fresh out of drama school, but Clark persuaded her, explaining that the naked audition wouldn't be filmed, and an email from her agent confirmed this agreement. So do you know and again, this is what I'm saying to you about monsters exist, but the institutions that they exist in are what help and abet they basically um aid and aid and abet them in doing their heinous crimes. An agent was contacted that one of their clients would be going into an audition which required them to be naked and they agreed because what they wanted their 10 to 15 percent that's who you really have to look at the, the 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 industry overall that kind of perpetuated this nonsense horrendous horrendous she said i was told 100 percent it was not going to be on camera james says as she understood it the naked audition was purely to check that she could, she could do the scene and wasn't going to bottle it on the day hopefully she kind of fired this agent as well this girl i hope she has the audition was mortifying james recalls after she pulled out of the running for the role she didn't want um one of her first acting jobs to be nude the guardian spoke to two friends of Powell and James who were also present in the pub that day and recalled the emotional exchange she said I was so upset now years later I still cry when I talk about it and imagine the conflicting emotions that she's going through at that time this is Noel Clark somebody that's very influential um very popular um has the ability to kind of greenlit you know a bit of a what, what's that word called there's a term for it but anyway he's able to greenlit many different projects and you're somebody on the come up you know how difficult it is to even get a job let alone to kind of you know uh, audition for one or to be in a certain room for one and you get given an opportunity a layup and all you have to do is take your clothes off 
all you had to do was just take your clothes off there must be a weird conundrum going on in your head where you're thinking if i just do this this could really change my life this could maybe allow me to kind of retire my mum, buy a house um get my first car you pay for the wedding right there's so many things on your mind that are like oh my god oh my god oh my god and then you turn it down and you generally think you might have ruined your career because you're thinking how about if this is what everyone does and i'm just dumb enough to think that i'm somehow exempt from doing that sort of thing but then you know luckily as time has progressed you know she's been okay she's been able to do other jobs and it's basically been proven that this guy was a creep but i imagine at that time what that must have what that must have felt like to go through such a crisis in your career do you know what i mean and all because somebody that you kind of she loved and thought that was actually here to support you has put you in that position. It's really inexcusable. It continues. It says, um, Clark denies covertly filming naked auditions or sharing such footage with Powell. A casting director who was present at James' audition said that there was absolutely no way Clark would have covertly filmed it, even without her knowledge. Hmm, that's interesting if he's got the footage. Maybe that's, you know, one of his friends backing him up. He said he's always been a good guy, she said. The Guardian also contacted others who worked with Clark who either declined to comment or spoke or... or to comment or spoke positively of him they include a makeup artist who said that she had a really good relationship working with clark no one to put their names on record though on the projects that worked together and an actor who had said suggest who had who said suggestions of misconduct did not tally with his experience with clark being generous and supportive others have said clark was supportive to fellow actors but at times sought to exploit their relationship which is hallmarks of an absolute creep clark helped james get into drama school when she was 22 see what i mean uh, so she was fresh out of drama school when she was 23 so that's a year later and he's already doing this nonsense he secured a discount on her fees um after she finished the summer 2012 she says clark joked about going upstairs to have s with her in a hotel where they were meeting she believes she and other alleged victims were young and naive when clark gave them professional opportunities and that's why it was taking so long to come out <sighs> clark and james were initially resistant about making complaints against a man they believed was considerable power in the industry despite this clark and james and several women of the guardian spoke to have agreed to go on a record others include one and actors which remain anonymous their pseudonyms are marked with asterisks the women work in almost every level of film that's what i'm saying every level making the hierarchy and represent the, the large range of races and ethnicities absolutely heinous but that being said I think there is a development now. Obviously, BAFTA suspends him over the allegations, which is, you know, again, flipping diabolical. Don't give him any props. They knew of these allegations prior and still allowed him to get up on stage and claim the prize. If he's accused of what he's accused of and it's true, that already is a crime in itself. And then you've got here a report from the BBC saying a report made to police about allegations of, against the actor. So some people are obviously going ahead with police, um, you know, uh, complaints towards him. But the most heinous thing, I think, has been some of his colleagues that he's worked with closely who have now come out and decided to kick him whilst he's down when knowing full well I would assume my understanding, especially from being within my little industry in streetwear, in fashion, in, you know, dance music, you hear things about people. It is what it is when you go out enough and you're around certain people. I don't think that this was some sort of secret that no one was aware of that some guy that you know was always a nice guy and no one knew he was bad was doing these things in secret i refuse to believe it i think everybody heard some kind of rumor no one wanted to maybe you know um confront it because you know it wasn't their business and didn't want to get involved but i refuse to believe that this is this everyone sort of learned about this that's in the industry from the guardian article i refuse and one of these people is this girl called michaela cole who obviously has a tv series here in the uk i forgot what it was called um something about her getting date raped i forgot the series anyways it's meant to be really good i haven't checked it out but she put a statement here saying i'm here for, to offer great support i think she's a co-star as well of um no clark in another series too she said i'm here to offer support for the 20 brave women who have come forward those who have shared their identities with us but also those who have preferred to use aliases the mental hurdles and black women <clears throat> must overcome to do such thing as a revealed the identity within a narrative of, of our abuse and bullying at the hands of somebody within our community can sometimes be too much speaking out about these instances takes a lot of strength because some call them gray areas they are however and far from gray these behaviors are unprofessional violent and can destroy a person's perception of themselves their place in the world and their career irreparably 
I have shared um I what's that? I have shared to show solidarity to express my belief that them uh, in them and to stand with them in their indignation I applaud the Guardian and its journalists for investigating and publishing this story again I just don't think that she had no idea I, I don't it's just my own opinion don't shoot me for it but I just think people within the industry knew that what was going on and decided to turn a blind eye because that guy was hotter than fish grease and it is what it is and it and unfortunately the ones who had to suffer were these um people who worked in every rung of the film industry who are basically coming across a guy who had you know unexplicable power who was able to kind of influence and change the narrative on certain things you know paint you out to be a crazy person victim shame whatever it may be but i just refuse to believe that none of these co-stars or people within the industry knew what was going on um and it's despicable that they were coming again that's you also all the people fair enough they got families and you know this guy just bought a mansion and shit but is there not <sighs> Is there not a position that you could be in if you're somebody's friend and somebody gets accused of something like this where you just say, this person's obviously a close friend of mine who I've done a lot of work with. Um, although the allegations are heinous, there are allegations at the moment and I'm going to rem I'm going to kind of uh, refuse to publicly chastise my friend until we really come to a point where, you know, court proceedings, are whatever's happened, and then I'll make another statement. Isn't that allowed? Like I mentioned before, what was, who's, who was his name? Um, the guy that did the hateful way, uh, what's his name? The, what's, what's that guy's name? The hateful way guy, what's his name? Um, da, 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 what's his name? What's his name? What's his name? Yeah, Quinta Tarantino. I mentioned this a few times on here before, but Quinta Tarantino was very close with Harvey Weinstein. I'm imagining Lionsgate, the, you know, the company that Harvey founded was responsible for a lot producing a lot of the films that he put out and when the allegations came out about harvey weinstein even quentin tarantino said something along the lines of like hey he's my friend and although the allegations are horrible i'm going to you know withhold from passing judgment until there's more evidence put out there and whatever it may be and then when obviously the court proceedings came and all that malarkey and more accounts he then came back out another statement and said obviously you know i don't endorse any of this nonsense and i'm here with the victims but he was able to say, like, hey, this guy's my friend. I'm not going to come and just bury them off the back of a one article that's been published in The Guardian. Regardless of how horrendous it is, there's still a little bit of loyalty that has to be kind of put forward when somebody's your friend. Now, someone can say, hey, there's no loyalty when your friend is a rapist, allegedly, or does those sort of things. I get it. But God damn it, this industry is foul, isn't it? You're up and then everyone's your friend. And then the moment one allegation comes out, they all kind of scutter into their little bunkers and throw out statements um, saying that they had no idea what you were like. Like, come on, you really had no idea what I was like? Really? Really? Let's continue. My thoughts are with the women. This is from Ashley, Ashley Waters, Asher D. It says, my thoughts are with the women who've come forward and told their awful stories. I'm in shock and deeply saddened by what has heard in multitude of levels. I would never condone the behavior of the nature um, of of this na of this nature neither in nor out of workplace whilst no has been a friend and colleague for several years i cannot stand by and ignore these allegations sexual harassment abuse bullying have no place in our industry every woman has a right to a safe workplace uh, moving forward i pledge my dedication to this which is what should be the ultimate lesson from all of this isn't it there needs to be a reckoning in general with men within the entertainment industry and maybe women as well in terms of how they place themselves how they view themselves how they present themselves we need to get to a place where you just treat the people that you work with in your industry with just a heightened level of respect it just needs to happen we just need to be in a place where like once i enter my tattooing world my skateboarding world my rap world my public influencer world whatever my little niche is community i should feel the safest there it shouldn't be the place where i'm actually going to be at most danger right it shouldn't be that if you're a video vixen you go and do a shoot and suddenly the shoot is the place where you probably are going to get abused more than you'd get in the street you should be feeling like hey once i step on that set these guys are basically my peers my colleagues we're in the same thing together they should be the ones looking out for me and making it uh, a far better place than the outside world is basically creating your own version of utopia within that little sub scene genre whatever it may be that's what we should get a position to being in because we can't be in a place where you know especially people that work within the industry day-to-day -day, producers executives uh talent bookers whatever it is are just getting abused by people who have all this power and influence and they don't want to call it out because they're gaining from it and then because you you're, you're kind of quote unquote nobody no one's going to believe your account that must be so mentally uh 
draining and hurtful to kind of go through right you clearly are having an instant you're clearly going through something that's clearly not right but you can't speak about it i don't know what that must do to somebody's psyche that must be horrendous to kind of go through especially in a sector or in a yeah in an industry a sector which is notoriously hard to get into right so once you do get into it you kind of don't want to kick yourself out by saying something too loud and you know uh being difficult quote unquote right this is the position that we're in at the moment so people need to really kind of wake up and just i don't know man treat people with respect men or women whatever it is treat them with respect within your scene even if you don't necessarily have respect in general um try and be respectful of people that you work with more so than people outside of that you just have to be you just have to create that level of safety within these spaces so that everyone can maneuver and do their best work because at this it's just disappointing and when you consider who no clark was and what he represents to film and all that malarkey in the uk it's just a disappointing part of it again am i happy with the trial by social media of course not should somebody's entire legacy and career be completely you know destroyed by one article that comes out in the guardian no but reading the allegations how basically he's basically responded to them basically victim shaming the people that allegedly the crime the alleged crimes against him um the way the industry has responded you know everyone's kind of got on their moral ethical soapbox and started to point fingers it's just a whole disgusting game it really really is and i don't know i guess just tell everybody if you're in this scene man keep your head in the swivel really do man don't ever assume just because this person seems nice on social that they're gonna be nice behind the scenes because everyone's got some crazy skeletons within this industry because unfortunately it's set up in a way to exploit and take advantage of people it really is it's just the way it is and they kind of sort of like foster and you know and build up these monsters and then when they do monster stuff they're all there pointing fingers and saying that we never knew yeah right yeah bloody right let's move on from that one let's move on from there what else do we have here oh yeah we have another one we have um Dachavelli decided to come out and make a statement regarding his situation which again man it's disappointing and sad to see him go through this to be honest especially when you consider how you know the trajectory he was on prior to the allegations that came out about him concerning a family friend texts were leaked um dms were leaked sorry um which kind of made it seem as if he was uh you know exchanging some sort of weird flirtatious messages with somebody that he deemed to be a family friend who was very young it was just a whole complete mess and unfortunately um maybe because he's new in the industry maybe because because of where he's from Dachavelli just didn't respond to it well he kind of tried to bully boy uh he tried to bad man himself out of this allegations and that obviously didn't resonate too well with people on social media then he tried to go silent and run away that didn't go go well with social media then he tried to kind of act like nothing happened that didn't go as good with social media then he did that whole thing about fake news and the, the the dms were manipulated that didn't go well with social media and essentially we're in a position where you know the family of the girl who alleged a crime have come out and basically said or who, who, who have alleged the uh, untoward contact or basically said there was, there's no issue we know dutch he's a family friend nothing's going on there uh, i think at one point the mum even basically said that oh it was actually me in the dms not my daughter which was way you know too much to even handle and comprehend of how nasty would actually when you consider they're supposed to be meant to be family but whatever you continue and then it got to a point where the family were okay with it so as a, you know as a the view in public we just had to move on because if the family are cool with it we just have to go even if we don't you know necessarily think it's um, all the way kosher it's not our place to kind of tell people how to interpret the actions of people within their family and then it seemed like it went completely silent and dead out here for dutch and i said it to a lot of people He's just unlucky that in the UK we just we just have a really zero tolerance policy really for people that are involved in anything to do with kiddie feeling. It's just is what it is. Anything to do with underage stuff, it's just always going to be a bad day for you. Like people are still making jokes about Tim Westwood to this day, and I think a lot of the allegations against him were you know whatever they were, but people are still not letting him live that live that down do you know what i mean it's just there's a thing in here in the uk which i'm really proud of where we just don't really stand for anything that kind of can be misconstrued as you know pedo behavior we're just not gonna have it and unfortunately for dutch he happened to be one of the victims of it and now he's basically suffering the consequences because he you know people aren't necessarily messing with him in that way now i still think he can maintain a career if he's happy with just 
performing in front of his fans and touring in that way but if he wants to be part of the music industry and stand next to certain people and do certain records it's just not going to happen um people are no one say they're ethically inclined or have morals or anything or have some sort of moral compass it's more so about disrupting the bag they don't want their artists they manage their event that they're promoting to be associated with somebody who they deem to be unfavorable with the public or with brands and with sponsors so he's in this crap position where if he's just happy performing for his fans he'll be fine if he wants to be part of an industry it, that's completely much over and look at the damage it's made for his sister do you know what I mean um, Steph London you know she can't post a picture without people making some sort of joke or insinuation as to what Dutch went through you know last year and whatnot. so it's definitely impacted the entire family I think the other sister even got involved in some beef and anyway um, Dutch decided to come out again and speak about the issue just to kind of you know try and rewrite the narrative and I don't know man I don't know it's probably a waste of time but let's play what we have to say so Dutch Valley speaks out again amidst allegations of him messaging a 14 year old girl also calls out Bouncer and Charlie Sleuth. Right, we have to talk about this. My video is still trending three days later. My little boy, no YouTube ads. You get it, man, look at it, no support from these blogs, man, it's still trending three days later. You see, these rappers with all the support of my mother's life, they're still not trending three days later. It's sad, that's why I can't be bothered to go back and forth with them. You know them way there, I'm lit. I am turned. That's a disappointing thing about it though, right? He's obviously definitely got a fan base that loves and supports him and then he got himself in a situation that he probably could have you know, uh, not got himself into and now his career has suffered for it, you know? Read it, learn. Best way to beat someone is to destroy them. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. It's crazy how I come out with. Man's come out with proof, paperwork to say, yo, police done an investigation twice. And said, yo, this is bullshit. I understand, man, when they talk to no minor in that form. And people are like, why is he talking to a minor? Yo. That's like my family, bro. You understand? I ain't gonna explain to you why I'm talking to a minor. You understand? I'm not talking to no random minor. That's a wild sentence, though, isn't it? I don't have to explain to you why I'm talking to a minor. I don't know, brother. You probably do, innit? And if you do explain it, you better make sure your explanation is watertight because, you know. You know like that? You see, this game, though, is mad for games, you know? Because when you, when you deep it, most of these blogs that we follow, we follow them for the latest news and the latest trends, bro. But these, these blogs now have turned to that is there to like throw shade on people when someone's down for is there the quickest to hand read it yeah but you should know that that's standard I think he's what he's basically getting at you know the fact that these blogs will you know build you up or you know speak well of you when you're lit and then as soon as you go down they're taking you know shots and happy in your glee it's just engagement of course when you're on your rise the people are looking for your content and your music and they can get something out of it of course they're going to capitalize on it and if you're on your last legs and you're damn bad then you should expect them also to kick you whilst you're down too and stomp on your head that is just part of the game it is what it is that's what you you know put kind of put yourself um, in the line of when you put yourself in this entertainment industry thing but the funny thing is that he's kind of surprised that you know the fact that he was able to kind of you know uh, pop off so quickly in a short period of time I think he had like a year period or 18 months where he just went from zero to a hundred really really quickly that he's under he's surprised that people you know his fellow rappers peers in the industry took the opportunity to basically you know destroy him and to kind of destroy his character off the back of his allegations of course they would why wouldn't they the easiest way to get somebody out of the paint especially if they haven't you know especially if it's not an artistic thing it's not like he put out a dud record or whatever he did something allegedly untoward something that is socially um you know socially unacceptable in any way shape or form especially here in the uk and essentially the community decided that hey this guy's done for and of course they'll take advantage of it it's unfortunate but it's not really a shouldn't really be a surprise if you're somebody like a dutch i wouldn't suspect anyway especially considering where he's come from like this is part of the game isn't it it's not like, you know what I'm saying? quick dialogue i was thinking bro how are these blogs moving so mad and again where, where was all this 
introspective sort of like reasoned um rational level-headed conversations and speaking uh, where was all this commentary when it was actually happening like i said he tried to bad boy himself out of this right or, or whatever right he tried to bully boy himself out of the situation and it backfired you know in epic epic levels i'm just basically shape boys and on my name and then when i'm behind the scenes with man sending them stuff saying yo see what you're posting there it's not right they say no they don't want to post this but they're posting every every other thing they're posting shit where people are coming in there so it's gonna say his name, I'm just gonna say the snitch. I put paperwork out on my Insta story, I see people still fucking. The snitch, he got dropped out, but I think that guy is a snitch. He's been holding feelings for a minute, so when this thing popped off now, so the snitch up now, I'm saying, bro, these people are jumping up. I'm saying this field rapper jumping up. I was trying to put him, I was trying to put him on my mixtape. I was trying to put him on my mixtape. I'm saying, bro, jump on this tune. Anyway, you, you get the drift in it. It's it's unfortunate <laughs> that this thing's happened, of course, when you're considering somebody's career. But well, considering the allegations, I, I don't know what this guy actually expected. I think it's a bit naive to expect people to just, you know, assume the best and to have the best intentions with people. That's not how the internet works. No one gives you the benefit of the doubt. If there's a smoking gun, people are going to run with it. If there's an inkling that you might have done something untoward, people are going to run with it. It's just the nature of the game. And like I said, if he's happy just being, you know, an artist that plays directly to his fans, you know, plays, you know, in front of, you know, whatever limited audiences, doesn't necessarily have the industry backing in front of camera. I'm sure people behind the, cam behind the scenes probably mess with him and still say, hey, this thing is bullshit, but what aren't willing to step out and take pictures with him on his Instagram and shit and, you know, collaborate with him and whatnot. It is what it is. The game is a game. He's probably, you know, going to have a hard time getting on some of those wireless stages and stuff this year. Two with festivals, which is probably going to be a big blow to the ego. But, you know, what can you do, man? This is a game you're in, isn't it? This is the game you're in. This is the game that you're in. Um, what else we have to talk about here? I think that might be it, you know. Should we end it there? Let me just double check and make sure I haven't forgotten anything on my list of stuff i want to talk about this and that that and this yeah i think that's it let's end it there for now but yeah end it there for now this is the excellent singer show episode number 455 thanks so much for tuning in as per you it's been a pleasure to have your company um of course if you're listening to this via youtube you know what to do smash that like button hit subscribe leave me a comment down below if you listen via the podcast app please leave me a five star review on the podcast app. i've already seen a few on their 10 or stars what well, sorry 10 uh ratings on there already so thank you for you if you've done that please make sure you do that for me it's helped the show to get up on the ratings all that malarkey and of course if you want to support the show via patreon to get access to the bonus shows please do that also at patreon.com for slash a g o s t i n h o that's patreon.com for slash agostino to join for as little as one dollar one pound per month to get access to all my bonus shows so make sure you jump on there get involved and i'll see you guys again very very soon peace